to the Annie Monday Podcast. My name is Colin Hemphill. And I'm Kayla Hemphill. On our show, we roll the virtual dice each week and must watch a randomly selected anime title. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Happy 20th episode. Woo! We are, uh, we're excited to be here for episode 20, and uh, we pretty much can't believe we've made it this far, <laughs> and things have gone well, I think, so yeah, uh, we're pretty excited about the uh, the podcast in the future. Yeah, and that people actually listen. Yeah. <laughs> We are planning a little something special after episode 25, so uh, look forward to that coming up. Yeah. So last week, we hit the random button on Crunchyroll, and the show that appeared is called Hinako Note. Uh, This show started as a four-panel manga series in 2014, and then was a 12-episode anime series, which is what we watched, and that appeared in 2017. Kayla, would you like to share the plot with us? Yes. Hinako moves from a small farming village to the grand city of Tokyo with the dream of becoming an actress. She only has one small barrier between her and her dream, the inability to partake in conversations. With the help of her new friends and roommates, maybe Hinako can make her dream come true. All right, so uh, that that plot is pretty self-explanatory. Like, the, the whole setup for the show is pretty simple and straightforward. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the fact that Hinako moves from the country to Tokyo and she like she ends up living in this weird kind of building where uh, they have a bookstore, a cafe and what is essentially a hotel built into the building and a uh, pretty sweet gig that she landed there. Uh, that one looks pretty cool. Yeah, I wish I had that going into college. Yeah. And I guess like the the conceit is that students can live there, uh, but they also have to work part time at one of those places that's in the building. Again, for free lodging, I 100% would have taken this up. Mm -hmm. And um, all of this kind of hinges on the fact that she uh, moves there in the hopes of becoming an actress. Uh, Anything about the plot overall that you were thinking about? Uh, It's sort of like what you said. The show is pretty simple. It shows you the plot pretty much from the very beginning, and it doesn't add a whole lot to that. Um, so there's not even really sub stories going on. It's sort of just like you're seeing them along her journey of becoming an actress and figuring that out and sort of just her daily life with her roommates. I kind of like to describe these shows as brain candy because it's something pleasant and easy and it doesn't take a whole lot of thought, but it's enjoyable nonetheless. Yeah, so... You, you mentioned, like, there aren't a whole lot of subplots or anything going on. I would even go so far as to say that the acting thing is kind of a subplot itself. <laughs> uh, because the main plot of the show seems to be more focused on her trying to overcome her social anxiety. Yeah. And you, you briefly mentioned that. But, like, we joked last week when we rolled this episode that the title of the first episode is My Talent is Becoming a Scarecrow. Yep. And the idea behind that is that when she gets into situations where she has to speak to another human being, she freezes up and, like, her arms go out and she turns into a scarecrow. Mm-hmm. Now, aside from that, animals love her. Uh, <laughs> so you will constantly see her like congregating with animals or birds just like following her around everywhere mm-hmm. and they land on her shoulders. But, and they talk to her. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, and sometimes she even utilizes that to to handle the social situations that she doesn't know how to navigate. Yeah, there's this really cute scene where Hinako happens upon a, a lost child right in front of the cafe And she finds herself unable to talk to the child, but she has a little bird that she's talking to. And the little girl gets excited about the bird. And so she uses the bird kind of like a ventriloquist doll and speaks to the child through the bird as a way of dealing with her anxiety. And it's a cute little thing. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So a few of the other characters that that appear in the show, it seems like moving forward, we've actually met pretty much everyone who matters in the show, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're all pretty easy to keep track of. The first character that we meet is Kuina, and uh, she is a girl who works at the used bookstore, and she has a huge appetite and is always wanting to eat everything, including uh, pages from the books that she is supposed to be managing. Yeah, yeah. This was both, like, hilarious and also a little offensive to me (laughs) (laughs) as somebody that is really particular about her books. Uh, Something to note about this character, she has a very classic style to her. I actually thought I had 
potentially seen the show before because I recognized how this character was drawn. And no, I hadn't. It's just a very common looking anime character. Right. She kind of looks like a cat. Yeah, she has the weird like cat mouth Mm -hmm. uh, with the the curves around her lips, Mm -hmm. which kind of makes her look mischievous. Mm -hmm. Uh, And typically I would I would see that used in like specific situations for a character. But with this character, it's all the time. Yep. And I can't even think of a specific case of another anime character where this is common, but you just kind of know it when you see it. Yeah. Uh, Even the way that her hair is styled is to look like ears. She also has an ahoge. Yes, of course. She's kind of an over-the-top caricature of this type of personality. Yeah. Um, One of the other characters is Mayuki, and uh, she kind of works at the coffee shop side of things, and is constantly in maid attire uh, (laughs) for seemingly no reason. Because she likes it. Yeah. I guess the only other defining feature of her is that she's really short. Yeah. Um, It's kind of funny because people point out to her like, oh, you must really like dresses because you wear them all the time. Even her school outfit is customized so that it's actually like one dress as opposed to like a top and skirt, which is what everybody else is wearing. Yeah. And she totally denies it. She's like, no, I don't like wearing dresses. I don't want to be a princess. But she looks like one all the time. The other thing I would say about her personality is that she really embraces kind of being everybody's mom, still like in a little kid way. But she's kind of the one that takes care of everybody really directly. So, like, she's the one that feeds everyone. She's always checking in to make sure people are, like, coming home on time. She's the very nurturing one out of out of the girls. Um, the only other person who lives at that, that house uh, with everyone is Chiaki. And uh, she's actually called the, the landlady of this, this manor that they live at, um, I guess because it's a family home. And she's kind of taking care of it at the moment. She's really tall. She's known to be a good actress, which uh, helps her connect with the main character. One thing that I noted about her is that she seems basically disinterested in everything. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a baffling character to me. I can't, I can't really make heads or tails of her. Yeah, I would agree. We haven't gotten to experience her very much. She's sort of just a character that comes in and out at the house uh, because she's obsessed with theater. So she's always like going to theater productions and shows and practices and that sort of thing. Like Colin was saying, it's really unclear about how she's managing the house because they don't really mention her family, but she's definitely in high school with the other girls. So it's just kind of a take it as you will sort of situation. Yeah, it's it's something I have not wrapped my head around and (laughs) I don't think they're going to provide any answers. It's just a thing. Like somebody has to be in charge at this weird place. And so they kind of put her in that role. Yeah. Uh, There's a couple other minor characters that we see. Uh, One is Yua, who is a terrible, terrible person. (laughs) She is one of the other classmates at the school. And she really admires uh, Chiaki. And to the point of like obsessing over her and her acting career and, and things like that. Uh, and gets super jealous about Hinako's relationship with her and ends up trying to constantly one-up her in anything that she does. Just decides, hey, I'm going to be your rival now, whether you like it or not. Which is funny because Hinako kind of takes it as, oh, she's being like a really good friend. Like she's always helping me out because she knows that I get really anxious when I'm talking to people. And um, they actually sort of start to become friends. It's it's the classic girl thing that we do called frenemies. And that's that's at least her perception of the relationship. The main character totally thinks that they're friends. And uh, the last one that I won't spend too much time on is Ruriko, who is a child actress, apparently. And uh, she comes in and acts as the advisor for the theater club at this high school. Which doesn't make sense because usually it has to be a teacher. Right. So... More confusion. Apparently, her career was so good that she's uh, (laughs) retired now and is a teacher. I don't know. At nine. Uh, Oh, yeah. Nine years old. I said child actress, but clarify. Nine years old. Uh, Any other thoughts on characters to wrap it up? Uh, One thing I kind of noted about uh, Hinako that I really liked was that she is kind of what I would picture a real life scenario of a Disney princess. That's something you see a lot with Disney princesses is that they talk with animals and they don't have any communication with the outside world. And yet somehow they are super personable with everybody. Um, And that does not seem realistic to me. 
this character as somebody who really struggles to interact with people but has an easier time with animals, this is like that same fear that I would imagine would be real. And you start to see her become comfortable with people so that, you know, with her roommates and her friends, she doesn't have a problem talking with them. And there's little things like you get to see her sing. And that's the first time she ever speaks without stuttering in front of people is when she sings. And that's like a big moment for her. And you kind of celebrate that because you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that she actually managed to do it. That's so great. And so a lot of the plot is watching her develop as a character, which is nice. Yeah. Um. So overall, I'll be honest, I don't like any of these characters, <laughs> hardly at all. Okay. Um, and I, I do agree that like the premise is more realistic with this character in the way that they interact with people. But I think the, the approach that the show takes in setting that character up is very poorly done. So for example, I find that her interactions with other people are really inconsistent. Mm. And it ends up making her seem like a person who couldn't exist because they're so wildly inconsistent in in the way that they meet people. Mm -hmm. And I I realize it's a comedy, so (laughs) things don't have to be super realistic. But she didn't feel believable to me. And one example of that is that there is this sweet old lady who is her neighbor, uh, her family neighbor. Mm-hmm. At, um, she operates a farm kind of near her family. And in theory, she has known this person her entire life mm-hmm. because that person has been at her farm. She's an old lady now. And Hinako would have known this person growing up and has terrible problems interacting with this person on like a normal basis. She interacts with her mom fine, but this other person that she's known her whole life can't speak a single word around her. And I actually went back and watched parts of episode one. As soon as she gets to Tokyo and meets the people who will become her roommates, she is instantly fine with them. There's zero social awkwardness. There's no stuttering. She just immediately connects with those people. Um, And you, you might think, well, maybe it's people her age. But no, she goes to school and she can't speak with anyone at school. Uh, So I I can't find a pattern to prove that this character is actually having these real interactions. Yeah, the only thing I could potentially see is anyone she identifies as like, this person is my friend. When she makes that click, that's when she seems to stop stuttering. Because even with Yua, she stutters at first when she's trying to talk to her. As soon as she decides that the two of them are friends, She stops stuttering altogether. So my understanding is that they have to be someone she like has that affection for and potentially not this old lady. Uh, And my only other thing with that is that her mom doesn't seem to know where she's getting the vegetables from other than that she thinks she might be stealing them. So I don't know that they're that close in terms of like being family friends or anything. So that would be my only hole to poke in your theory. Sure. I, I'm saying the show doesn't do anything to to address that, though. No, agreed. Um, you mentioned Yua. Let's let's talk about Yua. <laughs> OK, this is a this is a terrible character. Uh, as soon as she meets the main character, she does everything that she can to belittle her and put her down, calls her a fail shrimp constantly, even <laughs> after they start to become friends mm-hmm. and like harasses her constantly Mm -hmm. and it's it's played off as comedic effect but all this character did was exist and she immediately turns hostile to her and it's not done in a convincing way either you said this is like uh, a thing that girls sometimes do to each other but it doesn't feel like that it feels like she just flipped a switch and suddenly has to put down the character constantly yeah with this character because of her obsession with chiaki she immediately becomes jealous um that was something that you had talked about her affection for chiaki is almost romantic like some of the things that she talks about in terms of what she wants like the attention that she wants from chiaki the affection she wants from her almost seems romantic And so because the main character knows Chiaki well because they live together and they're friends, that that was enough for her to decide, like, you're my rival because I can be better than you. And that's just her mindset the whole time. Yeah, I would say it was even less than that, though, because she flips a switch when the main character just speaks to Chiaki. Uh, Yeah. They don't even reveal like, oh, we live together or we're getting to be friends 
It's like, how are you talking to her? How do you know who this person is? Like, I should be that person. You're like, okay, but... I mean, she is obsessed. This is your first day. You could go talk to her, you know? I think you're underestimating the awkwardness of high school girls. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) I would also say, overall, my kind of thoughts on the story. I briefly touched on this, but the idea that this manor exists is buck wild. (laughs) Uh, It is a bookstore, a coffee shop, a hotel, and a room and board for students, all in one. And if you look at the outside of the building, it does not look large. It employs inept students and is non-operational during the day because, in theory, the students are at school all day. So this place is just sitting there closed for the majority of the time, even though it's a coffee shop, which you would think would be open, you know, during the morning and in the afternoon, and is managed by a high school student who has no legitimate reason for actually being there. It gets zero customers. And I I don't know, it just feels forced and it feels kind of ham-fisted. It's funny to me because to me it sounds like a dream. (laughs) I'm like, this is where I want to live and this is where I want to (laughs) work. Yeah. It sounds awesome. I I just, I don't see the reason for it. (laughs) That's fair. All right. So uh, anyway, I think we're going to take a break and we'll come back soon and we'll talk about the production. We're back. Boy, that was a good break. (laughs) Felt like forever. It did. But now we're back here with you, the listener. (laughs) All right, Kayla, what do you think of the animation quality, character designs, art, music, and all of that kind of stuff? The character designs are probably the most obvious thing to talk about in this show because this is a style we haven't really seen yet. In our podcast, um, it is a lot of cheapy style. Yeah, I would say the art style flips between more of a a traditional kind of thing that we see these days. A very, like, typical example of what you see this decade uh, in terms of animation and character designs. And I would say nearly 25% of the show, they switch to a chibi style. Yeah, and it definitely goes with the feel of the show. It's... The show is really cutesy, and it's about these girls just being sweet with each other and kind of doing life, and some of their just, you know, exaggerated day-to-day emotions. Um, And so it's it's played up pretty well with the animation style. Personally, uh, I think it happens too often. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually I'm fine with this style because it's, it's fairly typical to see something that will change to that style on occasion to highlight cute moments or or comedy. Um, But like I said, it's a very large chunk of the show. Uh, In fact, I I would at times be watching the show and it would flip back to the normal style. And I'll be surprised because I almost forgot what the characters actually look like. Yeah, I found myself having that same experience. Uh, There's a, a show that came out past couple years it's called uh, Himoto Maruchan which uh, does this kind of thing a lot where it switches between two different styles one very chibi looking and it's a show that focuses on this girl who's really popular and smart and beautiful and very proper and elegant and when she goes home uh, she is a lazy slob who just plays video games and eats junk food Mm -hmm. And uh, the style of the animation completely changes between those two viewings of this character. And I like that because it's very obvious when the animation is supposed to change. There's a narrative reason for the change, and it always makes sense. You can know what the status of the character is, and you can know uh, where they are even just by looking at what the animation looks like. Uh, in this case, it, it felt more random and not quite as focused. Yeah, it's almost like they had two different animators doing the same show, and then they just spliced the two animations together into this one show. Yeah, I was I was kind of thinking the same thing, and that kind of made it feel disruptive. Yeah, that's probably the most jarring thing about this show or the, the thing that just didn't sit quite right with me. Uh, that being said, while there are parts of the show that focus a whole lot on the cutesy side of things... 
The show also randomly decides to like focus in on these very young girls' bodies, usually in ways that are not really intended to be sexual, but just to point them out to you. And that also felt really out of place. Yeah, agreed. There's there's kind of a weird sexual undertone throughout the whole show. And the fact that it does often focus on characters based on their age is not great. Uh, so an example is Mayuki is made to look like a child, and they constantly refer to her like that. Everyone thinks she's a grade schooler because of the way she looks. And kind of the flip side of that is that Chiaki seems like an adult, like way above uh, any of the other characters in the show. And then Ruriko is its own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, She is a nine-year-old, and they make a a big point of, like, pointing out her body and uh, her development. Uh, This kind of thing happens all through the show in random spots where you wouldn't expect anything to be happening. So I have a, a theory as to why this is. The original creator of the manga actually used to draw adult-themed comics. And I think this is sort of in that same vein of just like, that's what he's used to to doing. And so it just kind of bled through in the show that isn't about adult themes at all. Yeah, that would, that would make sense. Not a good excuse. No. For sure. <laughs> no. Um. There's, in fact, a TV trope called uh, Really 700 Years Old. Okay. And this is becoming a big deal in a recent anime series. Uh, but it's been around for a while. And it, it basically is a trope that tries to legitimize fan interest in a, in a younger character by saying, oh, they're actually 700 years old because they're immortal or something. Mm. So, like, uh, a recent example is uh, the Dragon Maid show Mm -hmm. where there's a young girl who is actually, like, thousands of years old because she's a dragon. Right. Um, This isn't exactly that case, but it's kind of the same outcome Mm -hmm. where you've got fan interest in a character who is young. And that, I think, needs to stop in anime. Yeah. It's It's not okay. Yeah. The only other production thing we haven't talked about is the uh, music. Uh, I don't know if you had any general thoughts. Yes, I do. (laughs) Um, Man, the intro and outro of this show is something else. Um, It is wild to watch. I would actually, if if you don't have any interest in watching this show, at least watch the intro because it is a trip. Um, It is very fast-paced. It, there's a lot of things happening really quickly, and I feel like how when I was in high school and me and all the other kids that were in the band would try to, like, stay up for the game because sometimes the games would go into, like, way over time, and so we'd bring candy, but not just candy. We would bring, like, tons and tons of sticks of pixie sticks and just, like, chug them and the high that we got from chugging all those pixie sticks, that is what this intro and outro is like for this show. It is just all over the place, super hyper, and just a lot. There is something like strangely addicting about watching it. Um, <laughs> in preparation for this episode, I think I, I went and watched, in particular, the intro several times. And it was just like, I don't. I don't know what I'm watching. I don't think I like it, but I have to watch it. Yes. Um, and, you know, the more I analyzed the music itself, the the less I enjoyed it. I, mm-hmm. I thought it's really disconnected. It doesn't flow well. The, the parts of the songs, like the actual vocalizations and the harmonies and the backing tracks that they're coming up with are not good. <laughs> um, so I don't I don't know what it is about it. Uh, and you're right, maybe it is chasing the uh, the sugar high. But, you know, that loses its interest the more you see it. And after being confused the first one or two times of seeing it, I was like, okay, actually, no, I'm, I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Uh, I think another thing that was kind of disappointing is that there's no subtitles for it at all. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes shows uh, won't directly translate the song into English, but there was there was nothing. There wasn't even like Japanese that we could then go and try and translate or anything. 
Um, so we have no idea what they were even saying. Be- and, like, you can't make it out because they're just singing so fast. And that that's a big part of it, too, because it seems like, based on the way that the song kind of flows, a lot of the sections are just, like, they're more talking than singing. They're, they're kind of a sing-songy sort of... Uh, delivery Mm -hmm. and without any context of what they're actually talking about um, you know we're missing a lot and so obviously that's on Crunchyroll more than it's on the show uh, for not providing English subs for that part but you know maybe they determined it wasn't worth it (laughs) so yeah sure all right Kayla would you like to close us out with general thoughts yeah so there's something kind of fun about this show um I like the energy. I like the characters. I think they're fun and they're cute to watch and they're enjoyable. They're they're likable in that way. And the show is really simple. It's really easy to explain and to get into. And like I said, it's, it's like brain candy. You know, it's, it's not really all that complicated. That being said, as soon as you walk away from this show, it is not going to stick with you. Um, this is not a show that makes you think or says anything or shows you anything. There's nothing really special about it other than that you're going to have a good time for, you know, a half hour. And that's awesome for that amount of time. And so while this is a show that I could like and get into, I don't think it ever has a potential to be like a favorite show. It's doing everything medium. And while I can enjoy medium sometimes, it's just it's not going to excel anywhere. I think I would agree with that. And me personally, I feel probably that I have more harsh opinions on this than <laughs> it deserves. Because mm. um, like we've had some really, really terrible shows that we've had to watch for <laughs> yeah. Any Monday. Mm-hmm. And this isn't one of those. It's like you said, it, it excels at mediocrity, basically. Yeah. It's kind of the middle of the road. You're not going to get anything out of it, but you might enjoy it. Yeah. So for the most part, I, th- I think it's harmless and there's nothing inherently terrible about the plot of wanting to be actresses or the characters themselves and their motivations. Uh, but I felt that everything around it was executed really poorly, uh, you know, from the animation to the music to, you know, the way that I mentioned earlier, like the character interactions don't always line up. They're not consistent. Mm -hmm. There wasn't like one thing I could latch on to that helped me to stick with the show. So I guess like you could say it's cute and I've enjoyed plenty of shows where the entire draw is it's cute, but there has to be something more to those shows um, to keep me interested. Uh, And primarily that's because they have excellent characters and Personally, I wasn't super connected to these characters. So all that being said, would you watch more of the show? I'm actually going to go a hard no on this one. (laughs) I had pretty much checked out by episode three, honestly. Um, I like started wandering off to do dishes and (laughs) would come back and was like, did I miss anything? No? Okay. Uh, And I was getting the gist the whole time and kind of knew what was coming and what to expect. And yeah, it wasn't enough to draw me. I think overall my my I think overall my feelings are that it really is like the epitome of mediocrity and I probably have more to say about something like that than I do about something that's truly awful uh where everyone just generally agrees that it's really bad and usually it kind of makes me upset when they have some kind of decent base to work with and don't do anything with it. And uh how about you? I actually would say yes, but with one condition. The reason why I'd say yes is because like Like I said, this is a fun show. Like, I had fun watching it. I thought it was cute. Like, it made me smile. And sometimes that's just something I need, you know? Um, Especially when sometimes we just watch some of these real dark and gloomy shows. I just need a little pick-me-up. But I think think I'd really only watch it when I started feeling, like, nostalgic. Because these girls remind me a lot of kind of what my high school experience was like, was being with my friends and being awkward and weird but like still having fun doing it and having relationships that meant something to me in the midst of my awkwardness. And I could relate to them because of that. It was something I experienced a lot of. And so as somebody who also dealt with like a lot of social anxiety and with talking with people is I I could latch on to the characters in a way that maybe you couldn't. And so 
yeah, I, I think I'll watch it when, like, I'm not going to go out of my way, like, right now to watch it. But I think as a pick-me-up sometimes, I, I would totally go back to the show. But like I said, I don't think it'll be something that'll stay with me for a long time. All right. Sounds good to me. I, I would say I um, I also, you know, experience social anxiety, <laughs> but my face doesn't turn chibi when that happens. So, you know, we experience life differently than these characters. <laughs> says you. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to learn more about our show, you can visit our website at anamonday.moe. That's anamonday.moe. You can send us questions and comments to podcast at anamonday.moe. And you can find us on our Facebook and Twitter. Our username is anamondaycast, and you can find links for that on our website. Thank you so much to Crunchyroll for providing all of the anime that you have and uh, for the random button, which produces these wonderful and wonderfully terrible results. If you want to follow along with us each week, we'll have a link to the current title on our website and social media, and you can watch what we're watching. Finally, thanks to C2A for providing the intro and outro music of our program. You can find his music on Bandcamp and other major streaming services. I'll also provide links to his music in the show notes and on our website. Are you ready to roll? All right, I am ready. Random button in three, two, one. The anime for this week is Glass Mask. And the first episode is called The Girl of a Thousand Masks. Okay. It kind of looks spoopy. It does. This is very different. Worth noting, there appear to be two versions of this on Crunchyroll. Uh, There is the 1984 version, as well as the, uh, I guess, more modern version, which is the one that we got. Okay. All right. I think that's going to do it for us. All right. We'll see you all next week. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye. All right. So uh, anyway, I think we're going to take a break and we'll come back soon and we'll talk about the production. In two days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you have to wait that whole time. <laughs>